missed. Don't forget, hopefully we get to have trunk and treat tonight. I know uh, the teens are looking forward to it. I think most of them are. Uh, they're going to dress up. There may be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man there, so we'll see. Uh, but it should be fun. Superhero theme. All right. And uh, I wanted to share, too, we've, uh, as you turn to Romans 10 this morning, uh, that's where we'll be. Uh, notes are there on the back of your bulletin. I wanted to share, we had a, a good time last Sunday night at youth group. We, um, I, I felt the fever coming on, so uh, I don't remember lots of it. But uh, what I do remember is I try every month or two to give the teens a passage, and I think they're kind of, sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't. But they have to teach me, basically. They have to read through the passage, and I ask them three questions. What do you learn about God? Uh, what do you learn about us people? And then who cares? Why does it matter? How does it apply? And uh, I was pleasantly surprised that uh, they had some very good answers last week. And it, it's, it's fun to see their brains starting to process through some of those things and how these scriptures can apply to their daily lives as well, just as we seek to apply it this morning. So with that being said, uh, I wanted to share that so you guys know what's going on, and uh, it's, a good, uh, it's good to see 15 to 18, whatever were there last week, start opening up God's Word and start talking about spiritual things. It encourages my heart, and I, I, I hope that is the case this morning as well as we dive into Romans 10, 5 through 17. Now, as we've been on this journey looking at some evangelism things, uh, we come through to a particular uh, subject this morning that I, I want to hit on because um, as we emphasize uh, these particular verses, I, I wonder, as you come to this, you have to wrestle with the question, am I saved or not? Now, that, am I a believer or am I lost? Now, that term saved is not a widespread a term that is used anymore, and I think many may be even confused by it because it's not a cultural cultural norm to use that terminology. But, but simply put, what I'm referring to is, are you a believer or are you not in Christ? Now, not just a, I know there was a Jesus, but are you committed to him? Do you know him as Lord? Is he your Lord? Is he why you live the life you live? And we all have to wrestle with those questions, especially this morning as we're going to jump into Romans 10, because I believe uh, this passage is going to speak directly to that very issue. We're going to hit it head on this morning. What is required for salvation? What are the bare necessities for belief to take place? And how do we communicate those to others? And what's the church's role in all of that? Those are the questions I'm hoping to answer and more as we dive into Romans 10. So first, let's look at the uh, verses 5 through 9. Uh, it's up there for you. Salvation requires Christ. Seems obvious, but this is the argument Paul is going to make here. Look at verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because... If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All right, so here is what is happening. Here's what Paul is getting at, and I think it's important because there's going to be a little background here that Paul is making this argument for us. And the, there was confusion amongst the Jews and this new Gentiles that were offered this gift of salvation, there was confusion with the Jews, and they were wondering, do, do we still keep that Mosaic law? And we read that back in the Old Testament, and uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, all those we read about, the, the Mosaic law there, Exodus as well. And the Jews, they were confused. They, they're hearing about this Christ, and he says, just live for him. 
follow him. And, and they're like, yeah, but I was raised over here following this Mosaic law. So what do I do? How do I make sense of all this? And Paul is going to try to clarify all of that. Because the Jews were still hanging on to this, this works righteousness. I have to do these things in order to be uh, saved. I have to do these things in order to be a believer in Christ. But Christ says, or Paul says, that Christ came to fulfill this law. He's saying Christ took care of all that. You don't need to do those things anymore. Not that those things are bad, but that's not going to get you to heaven. He begins right here, Paul says, by stating that the law was good. There, there was nothing bad about the law. The people in Israel needed the law. They needed, a, we, and we can see this today, we need a, a system of uh, law and order, don't we? We need this kind of parameters that we can work in for society to function. And God gave the, the people in Israel that same sort of law so they knew how to function in this world. And, uh, and, James 2.10 says, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has been guilty of all of it. See, the point Paul is trying to make is you can do the whole law, which we know you can't keep it all perfectly. You can do all that, but that's not going to get you to heaven. That's not going to get you that salvation you want. You need someone who could perfectly keep the whole law, and that person is Christ. That, therefore, uh, salvation only comes through Jesus. Jesus is the only means by which we are going to experience eternal life in heaven with him. He is the only one. Everything goes through him. The law could not accomplish that. Faith is the key to true eternal life. Now, as you see in this passage, there, there's many quotes here that Paul is using. He's quoting from different passages in the Old Testament, and I'm not gonna, we're not going to read all those because we'd basically be reading the same thing, but it's important to know where they came from because I'll explain more at the end because Paul, he's very wise in the arguments he makes. There's a reason and purpose for everything he's saying, and I believe it's no different here. He begins with a, a quote from Deuteronomy 30. And he's saying, we don't have to look hard to find Christ. Yeah, some people, they're trying to go to this higher plane. Some people, they're trying to go down to this abyss and bring Christ back. And all that has been accomplished. Paul's saying, you don't need to keep looking for these things over here and over there. But he's saying, Christ is our righteousness. He has already accomplished all these things. Stop looking over here. Stop looking over there. Christ is here for you. Faith in Christ is the only means of salvation. Now, he again quotes Deuteronomy 30. And the point is, Paul uh, wants his readers to see that the Old Testament law was to point to someone who would fulfill it. You see, these, the Jewish people, they'd had their eyes so stuck on keeping these rigid rules that we find in the law. And the whole time, they're forgetting that, uh-oh, I forgot. This is supposed to point to someone else. I'm supposed to keep my eyes on that Messiah that was promised, and they missed it. They missed that that Messiah had come. Christ had come to be their righteousness. He fulfills that law. Moses was teaching the way to faith in Christ. Moses was teaching about something that would come later. He was teaching that Christ is going to come. He's going to fulfill this law. So how do we do? How, how do we confess? How do we, how do we believe in Christ? And many people want to know, I, I hear about Jesus. I, I know about Jesus. I've read some things in the Bible, but what do I do? What do I say? Well, verse 9 makes that very clear. Paul says, confess and believe in Christ. Confess and believe in Christ. First, confess that Jesus is Lord. Now, this isn't some kind of genuine, yeah, I believe Jesus is a Lord or is a God or he's a little better than the rest of us or he's just a prophet or something like that. It's not a general belief. It's, uh, in fact, Libby, throw up James 2.19 for us. 
you believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Even the demons, even Satan knows that Jesus is, uh, is God. That, that's not enough. This is a deeper belief that Jesus is your all in all. He is everything. This is a key matter to faith. It includes repenting of your sins and trusting Christ for your salvation. But there's a second part to it, that belief. He says, believe essentially in the resurrection. Believe that Christ rose from the dead. The resurrection of Christ was one of the key elements to true belief in the early church. They, they, they held that as a high standard to see if people had truly repented or not, because many denied that Christ had risen from the dead. And in fact, Paul addresses this to a church in Corinth in chapter 15. Olivia, throw it up there for us. He makes this argument, if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, and even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sin. You see, Paul is not saying Christ had not been raised, but he's making the argument that that is essential to belief. That is essential to your belief in Christ as your Savior. You must believe he did what he said he did. You see, without the resurrection, there is no salvation. Christ had to rise again. The mouth confesses and the heart believes. Put another way, the, the mouth can only confess what your heart truly believes. You see, the, these things are working together with one another. That one is in here, that spiritual heart that you have, and the other is the mind where the, the mouth confesses those things. We must believe what we, what we say and what we, what we confess and, and say to others, what we share to others. We must believe these things about Christ, that, these, that Jesus is Lord, and that he truly rose again. See, the resurrection shows that Christ is the victor over death. And because he is the victor, he has been, been given that name that is above every name. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. The staggering fact you know, other beliefs have these, uh, they, they say who Jesus is. They want you to know that he was a good person. Some say he was a prophet. Some say all these things. But the staggering fact is, is that, and what is unique about Christianity is that Jesus isn't just another God. He is God. Jesus isn't just another Lord, uh, a ruler or a prophet or someone like that. He is the Lord. He is the almighty this is what a Christian, at the very basics uh, of what we believe about Christ, this is what we believe. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. He rose again for us, and now we must believe in him. Salvation requires Christ. Second, look at verses 10 through 13. Paul's going to build on this argument. Salvation requires heart transformation. Salvation requires heart transformation. Uh, verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Salvation requires a heart transformation. This now I, I've talked about it the last several weeks. This dead heart that we had, and only Christ can make it alive again. This is what Paul is getting at here as well. There must be a, a transformation, a change of heart, spiritually speaking. Look at verse 10. Heart transformation leads to a, a verbal confession. You see, uh, Paul is just building on his argument in verse 9. This is an inward belief that expresses itself outwardly. In fact, it's, it's a unique Greek phrase that I had to do a little extra work this week because uh, it was so unique as I began studying this. It, it's, 
it's, it's unique because both the inward and the outward agree with one another. A one can't believe one thing or say one thing without the other saying the same thing. You can't believe one thing here and say something out here. These two have to work together. So Paul, again, quotes the Old Testament. He says, and here's another one, Isaiah 28, 16. His point is that anyone and everyone who believes these things, both inwardly and outwardly, will be saved. They can experience salvation in Christ. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile, all believe, who believe these truths will be saved. And only to further this point, he again quotes uh, from Joel, and, and notice a different passage there, and I'll come back to why that's all important, because these quotes, I believe, are, are showing something very, very clear that Paul is trying to stress. He, he started with the Deuteronomy, right? It, it, the, the original Pentateuch, the first five books, the Jews held that to a very, very high standard. Many had to memorize those books. But then he switches to Isaiah, uh, one of the more respected major prophets in the Old Testament. And then he switches to Joel, this minor prophet, if you will. And Paul is building this argument that this law that was so far away is pointing to something. All throughout the Old Testament, we see him pointing to Christ. Christ is the key. This is not accidental. I don't believe. Paul did not do things like this on accident. He was building an argument. These things all point to Christ. So, how is that relevant to us? Well, I believe that this affects our basic understanding of who and who can't be saved, who can't have or who can have eternal life. You see, it affects our, our, our neighbor or our, our, our brother, our sister, whoever, our, our father, our mother, our grandfather, grandfather, whoever it may be. It affects what we share with them. It affects how we share with them, that we know that the salvation is made possible for them, but they must confess and believe it. It's not enough to just be a good person. It's not enough just to come to church. It's not enough just to serve others in the community or, uh, or put something in the mail for somebody. That's not enough. Christ says, Paul says, belief in him is enough. Confess and believe that Jesus is Lord. That's what is enough for your salvation. I think... The reason Paul mentions calling on the Lord here, in addition to believing on the Lord, is because he has in mind a salvation larger than just our, our justification. I, I, I know we mentioned that briefly last week, and we'll mention it next week because the 31st actually marks a very important date for all Christians, uh, and we'll deal with Romans 5 next week. But uh, I think this affects our daily living because if we have that confession, if we have that belief that Jesus truly is Lord, it affects how we live each day. It affects when something hard comes into our lives. It affects when uh, a, a bad phone call comes in the, uh, on the phone, right, uh, from the doctor. It, it affects, the, you know, it, it, how we interact with others. It affects if, you know, something bad happens on our way to work or whatever it may be. It affects how we live our lives. Because if we know and we have confessed that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead and now he is our Savior, we go into each day knowing that that is with us, that he will not leave us, that comfort that we can experience, that faithfulness of God that he has given to us is a comfort for our souls that each day we can go into it knowing that this life is not all there is when we have Jesus. We know there is another side. We know that if something bad happens here, we will be with him again in eternity. We can have that promise written and stamped on our hearts each day, knowing that Christ is our Lord. But first, there has to be 
a heart transformation. There has to be a change of priorities. There has to be, as Paul says in Ephesians, a, a, a switching from the old self and dying to the old self and putting on the new man or new woman that is in Christ Jesus. Last, verses 14 through 17, salvation requires the gospel. Salvation requires the gospel. Here's what verse 14 says. How then will they call on him uh, in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing from, through the word of Christ. Salvation requires the gospel to be shared. Please notice what Paul has laid out. He said, salvation requires Christ. Salvation requires a heart transformation. So how do you come to know these things? How does someone just happen to know these things? And you can't just happen to know those things. You see, from the beginning uh, that this scripture was completed, that we were given this good news for a reason. And that is so we might know that we, can, that we must confess Jesus as Lord. You see, the gospel is essential. Everything that we're talking about here, everything with evangelism, everything with the church comes back to that book. It comes back to the gospel. Now, Paul, as you've seen here, is going to use a series of uh, rhetorical questions. Why? Uh, he's trying to emphasize the need that the gospel is presented before saving faith can take place. Uh, you, you hear, uh, he makes this argument, he says, you have to hear, you have to read about the truths of Jesus uh, before you can be saved, but this requires first that the gospel be shared. See, the gospel must go forth in order for this confession and belief to take place. I believe Paul is quoting, again, all these verses that he's quoting here, and he does another one from Isaiah because he knows all these come, things come to a certain person. It comes to a certain point, and that is Jesus. He wants Jesus to be the central focus of this gospel message because he is the central focus of this gospel message. He is who we share with the lost. Let me throw up Hebrews 5, 9 for us. It says, and being made perfect, talking about Jesus, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who believe in him. See, salvation requires faith in only one person, and that is Christ. Hearing the gospel is necessary for salvation, but hearing is not enough. People also must respond. As we see Paul saying here, he, he lays out this argument. Uh, Olivia, throw up the next one. I'm, I think I laid it out for you. Yeah. He says, a preacher must be sent. The, the sent preacher must preach the good news. The preaching, the preach good news must be heard. The heard good news must be believed. The belief must be the kind that calls on God for salvation. So we see a pattern here. Sending, preaching, hearing, uh, believing, calling on. And when you hear the preaching, don't, get, don't take that as you have to be me up here doing this. It, it's sharing the good news with others. Hearing, believing, calling on God. And then we see this pattern uh, start all over again. You see, God has given us this method to, to share this good news that he has given to us with others. Philippians 3 says this, um, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. This is Paul. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. You see, Paul had to wrestle with these same truths. I, I believe as much as he deals with this, 
It's personal for him. You see, Paul was, grew up as, as Saul in the Jewish order. He, ris, he was risen uh, much higher than his, his fellow uh, colleagues, if you will. He, he rose up so fast. He knew the law. And we see this uh, transformation happen in, in Saul, who became Paul's life. We see this transformation. You see, he thought obeying the law, doing these things for, for the church, if you will, for, for, for God, would get him to where he wanted to go, this eternal life. But he quickly found that it took a transformation of his heart. It took this sharing and believing this gospel, this good news about Jesus, to change his heart. See, we can do all these things, but they won't get you to where you want to ultimately go. See, we must simply believe the saving faith that Paul talks about. Believe in Christ as Lord. One author I read this week, he makes four observations about saving faith, and I think they're, they're good for us this morning. He says, saving faith believes on Jesus as Lord and calls on him as Lord from the beginning. Saving faith believes facts. Uh, and those facts come from the scriptures, but those facts are not enough. It, 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 we believe more than just those facts. It, it's this personal confidence. It's this personal belief we must have in Christ that he will save us. We believe his saving promises, his, his saving uh, truths, that eternal joy, eternal life with him will happen. And then last, it, the saving faith includes a spiritual satisfaction in Jesus. You see, this is all these things when we confess. We're, we're believing these things, whether we, we would say them like this or not, but we're believing Jesus is Lord. We're believing that there's something bigger and greater than us for this life. We're believing that what the scripture says is true, and then we can enjoy that eternal life with Jesus. That is what we're sharing to the lost. That is what we're sharing to our, our neighbors, our, our brothers, our sisters, whoever it may be, our, our sons, our daughters. This is the message we share. Is that Jesus is enough. Complete saving satisfaction can be found in Jesus and Him alone. I, I close with this. Don't make the fatal mistake of thinking that just because you're a good enough person or you've done a good enough things, and there's several watching this morning too, that that's going to get you the saving faith you want, that that's going to get you the end result you want, because it won't. As we've seen here, none of those things will get you to heaven. None of those things will get you to Jesus. Jesus did not Give up the glories of heaven and suffer the agonies of the cross so that you can have that, that belief that I can do enough to get there. Jesus didn't do those things for that reason. He didn't die so that you could just feel good about yourself. No, Jesus did those things to save us from our sins. That is the message we share. It's not just come, just trust Jesus and everything's going to be all right. That, that's not true. Things are not always happy in the Christian life. This last week was not a very good week in the Smith household as I was down. Christina's still battling through it. The kids, three, were bouncing off the walls because they had been down, you know, and then we decided to watch a dog for some reason. I don't know why. It was not a great week, right? Things are not always easy in the Christian life, but God's promise is this. It will be. One day, if you believe in Christ and trust him, one day all things are going to be made new. And he promises this. If you believe in him, if you trust him, he is faithful. He is never, as we talked about a few weeks ago, going to leave your side. He will be with you always through the journey. I, I remember, I'll, I'll end with this, but I remember a story, uh, a, a former friend, pastor, he, he taught me, he, he was saying when he went into the Navy, he was sharing his testimony, and 
Now, some of the details I, I don't remember too well, but I do remember this. Yeah, he was young. He was uh, was not. He did not grow up in church, and, and he was he was headed for the navy, and his life was all before him. And there was this man that would pass out these uh, New Testaments to people as they got ready to leave. And this guy would just stand there, and some, you know, they threw him back at him. They were they were very rude to this guy, but he he kept handing them out to anyone who would take him. And this this guy. He told me that he didn't care about it, but he stuck it in his pocket. And it was several months later that he, he pulled that New Testament out and he began reading the truths of, of who Jesus was and what Jesus had done and these truths. And he, he began to see that this was for him, that these truths were for him and Jesus could be his savior. You see, we don't know what our interactions or our sharing uh, about Christ will result in. But we won't ever see any results if we don't do it. So that's my encouragement to you this morning. If you don't know Jesus, call on him today. Confess Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. But for the Christians, for the church here this morning, I, I, I ask you, just as uh, Paul is laying out this gospel message for us and telling us, confess and believe. That is our message. Confess and believe that Christ is Lord. That's what we share. That is what we share, and that is our mission today. So we need to get busy. Let us pray. Father, thank you today. Father, I am grateful that uh, left on our own devices, we are hopeless but you have laid out for us. You have given us uh, this message of hope. The gospel shines forth in, in the midst of darkness. The gospel shines forth as a source of hope, as a, uh, as a beacon that is calling out uh, to those who will believe. And I, I pray this morning for those who are wrestling with this belief in Christ today that they will confess him as Lord and that their lives will be transformed by the, the, the Word and the Holy Spirit using the Word to uh, sanctify their lives. And I pray also that you will give us the courage. I, I think we forget many times that Paul wrote these things uh, to uh, other churches. And as they're being read in the church, some of them would not have been received very well. But he was faithful, and he kept going. He kept pushing. And we see throughout the New Testament, many people come to know Christ because of Paul's work. And I pray today that you will give us that same courage, that same perseverance to keep sharing the good news of Christ. And in your name I pray, amen.